All right. So good morning. Um, we, we won't spend a whole lot of time reviewing what we went over last week because that was kind of the building that we're going to keep covering as we go through. So we're going to keep repeating a lot of those things. Um, where we were uh, last time, though, where we ended off is uh, we were talking about this idea. Uh, the, 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 the given name for God in the Bible. Anybody know? Okay. Je Jehovah. Okay. Um, so scholars will argue back and forth on what is pronounced as. We'll probably just keep going with Jehovah because it's what we're most familiar with. His covenant name with Israel is this, this Jehovah. That doesn't show up that often, if at all, in the book of Ecclesiastes. So some of those things kind of hint that the book of Ecclesiastes is written for an audience like us that isn't made of primarily Jewish people. All right. Um, so what, what, what some people look at the book of Ecclesiastes is, is it is basically Solomon writing to a, almost like a secular audience and kind of appealing to them in, with wisdom. Um, so that's where we, we kind of left off last week. And then we proceeded to read the entire end of the book because, you know, there were some points that he was making there. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we, you know, we started Ecclesiastes with the very end. It reminds me of, I had a teacher, we were going through Minor Prophets, and uh, we were just absolutely slogging our way through, you know, the Minor Prophets. And so finally he's like, all right, everybody look, and he, whatever the last one in the list is, I think it's Malachi. Um, and uh, he, he turns to the very last one, he's like, all right, everybody, everybody look at it. Okay, that way we can say we looked at all the Minor Prophets. And that's basically how we got to it. So I can say we have finished the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, in the first day. Uh, anyway, so as we are looking at the book of Ecclesiastes uh, and we're digging into this concept, Solomon is doing a few things here, all right? So what he's doing is he's expressing, as he goes through the material, through apparent contradictions. This, this is an important fact. I'm going to caution you guys, if you're ever reading the book of Ecclesiastes, be extremely careful not to pull random verses out, all right? This is an especially dangerous book to pull random verses out. Because there are times where Solomon is intentionally saying something that may not be completely true, but in the context it's true. Like, when, when, you, when you kind of build all around it, he's saying, I believe something, or I would believe something if these other conditions were true. Okay, we're going to get into that in just a moment. I'll show you some of the repeated words, and I want you guys to kind of wrap your mind around that. But what he's doing is he's showing some apparent contradictions, all right, and... So, so again, Solomon is seeking to express through apparent contradictions the fact that anything sought for outside the provision of God, okay, so this is going to be another really important fact throughout the book of Ecclesiastes. There's going to be this overarching thing of, of God is sovereign, God provides, God does things behind the scenes that you just don't see, and that's just going to keep being repeated like over and over and over. Um, and that's, that has to do with a key word I'll bring up in just a moment. So anything sought for outside the provision of God will be as fleeting as vapor, all right? Uh, the word he's going to use here is, is the word hevel or vanity. Um, it's it's this, this fleeting, like, you think you found it, you think you've grasped it, and, and it's gone by the time you get there. And it'll be about as pleasurable as chasing the wind. So if you can understand this, this is basically summarizing the entire book of Ecclesiastes, all right? So again, he's seeking through apparent contradictions. And, then, and I've actually heard, uh, when I was doing research for this class, uh, I, I, I pulled up, I don't know if it was a Yale seminar on it, or it was, I, I gathered perhaps that the person doing the lecture wasn't uh, a believer, but I, I wasn't sure. And they were showing all the contradictions in the book of Ecclesiastes. And they were just reading off like, so, you know, here's this one, and here's this one. And it, okay, it, you missed the point. Like, if you think that those are actual contradictions, you, you missed the connective tissue, all right? Um, it's a lot of people just look at the skeleton and they're like, oh, that's not making any sense at all. But once you start piecing things together and looking at some of the key words that kind of tie the whole book back and forth, you're like, okay, that's why he said that. And that's why that's not wrong to say, because he's, he's putting it in a little box that says, for instance, if God doesn't exist, then all these weird things happen and it's just pointless. He's not saying life is pointless. He's saying... If there is no God, life is pointless. But, so that, that if you, again, if you understand the key words, if you understand the theme, then as you read it, whenever you come into this apparent contradiction, you're like, that's probably what he's trying to do here. All right? So before we continue, let's open in a word of prayer, and uh, then we will get into some of this, this material here. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all that you've given us. I thank you for this time where we could just gather around and study out uh, Solomon and, and the wisdom that he's uh, laid out for us. I pray that we'd be wise with our application of these truths. 
um, but also that you would just be honored and glorified in uh, just the wisdom that you've allowed us to have. I thank you, God, and uh, I pray all this in your name. Amen. All right, if you have notes, um, we are on page uh, two, so we're moving, you know, one page a day. We're, we're doing really good. And uh, on page two, uh, you'll see the big box in the middle. That's what we just said. We're going to cover a few words that are repeated, and uh, most of the information is going to be straight out on the, the notes. Um, but again, if you feel the need to add, go for it. Uh, these are yours to keep, so uh, hopefully you're not shy about that. There are a few repeated words, and uh, I'm going to cover them in brief here. And then as we go through the text, um, we're, we're going to just keep repeating these over and over. The first one, which you absolutely must understand if you're going to grasp the meaning uh, of Ecclesiastes. Anybody know what the main word that just comes up over and over and over is? Vanity. All right. The word vanity comes from the Hebrew word hevel. Um, it's used about 38 times throughout uh, this book. It is often translated vanity, but it actually has a, a, a massive range of meanings. Okay. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll get into it. What, what I like about it is that the translators just translated it vanity. So pretty much wherever you are in the Bible, if you see the word vanity, you're, you're probably dealing with the word hevel. The word hevel, again, depending on the context, can have a huge range of meanings. But it's this idea throughout of futility. Uh, sometimes it can have the idea of frustration or emptiness. Uh, sometimes it could be like you... You've worked really hard to get to an, uh, an objective, and once you get there, it's not what you thought it was. That's, that's this idea of, of vanity. It's this, you thought it was going to be substantial, but it turned out not to be. So the illustration I use a lot of times uh, would be, if you know anything about mythology, you're, you're familiar with the concept of a will-of-the-wisp, all right? So if you're not familiar with a will-of-the-wisp, uh, basically way back in the day, there were these mythological creatures that would be right off the path. And so you'd be walking through a swamp at night, and you'd see this little glowing object, and you'd, you'd turn off the path to go find out what it was, and you'd, you'd think you were going to be able to catch it, and it basically would lead you into a trap, in essence, as it was. But every time you thought you got up to it, it would vanish and, you know, reappear farther back. Back in break. Basically. Yeah, they, that's basically what those little glowy things were. All right? And so what happens is, the will-o'-wisp, it basically is always just a little farther out of reach. All right? Uh, it's, that's, that's the idea where when you are seeking after something that is vanity, the moment you think you've grabbed it, it, it vanishes and appears a little farther back. And that's, that's this idea. Solomon is trying to figure out what satisfies. He's trying to figure out what brings profit. And every time he thinks he's achieved it, it vanishes and appears a little farther away. So he has to try something new. And so the, literally it's the idea of wind, uh, vapor, okay? So kind of vapor coming out of the top of a tea kettle. You reach out, you try to grab it, you think it's substantial, it's not. That's this idea of vanity, okay? So every time you think you've gotten your hands on it, it looks substantial, it looks solid, but it vanishes the moment you get your hands on it. So that's the concept. So it can be an idea of frustration, emptiness, uh, pointlessness. There's a whole bunch of different meanings. But again, the word is simply translated vanity. And, and so you'll see this most often. Uh, Solomon will say, vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Uh, the other expression you're going to see is these ideas of what is the good or what is the gain or profit or what is the portion. So these ideas are going to be particularly prevalent um, at different sections of the book. So there will be part of the book where he'll focus on what's the good to do. And then he'll kind of change and he'll pivot and be like, okay, what... What is the profitable thing to do? And then you'll pivot again. And he's like, all right, well, this is the portion that I have. And so, so you'll kind of see Solomon seeking after different things. So pay attention. Um, it's not so much important to know the, the Hebrew behind it. I think the Hebrew is important with, with Hevel. Uh, because, again, it's just, it, it's a word that means vapor. But, uh, again, I do like the fact that it is pretty much universally translated vanity. Uh, they don't try to interpret it for you. Uh, I'm not sure, as you get into other versions, you may run into where they've tried to interpret it for you, um, but it, I don't trust translators to do much of the interpretation. I'd rather you just tell me what the word is, and context will determine a lot of that. But there are times, depending on what version you're looking at, they'll, they'll try to translate some of these words the best they could, but again, the King James at least, they just always translate it vanity, uh, and so you kind of know, all right, that's what that word is. All right, uh, so again, Solomon is going to dig into some of these concepts. He's going to start out, you know, looking at what is good. He's going to start digging into the idea of what, where is their profit to be gained. Um, this is where it gets kind of depressing because he'll talk about like, hey, I laid up all this wealth. I did all these wise things. 
and basically I'm going to die and I'm going to leave it all to someone who did nothing. What's the point? Like, why, what is the profit to that? Like, that seems stupid to me. And, okay, th yeah, that's part of it. And that, w that leads us to the third major expression you're going to see throughout, and it's called under the sun. Now, to understand this one, I want you guys to think uh, if literally there was nothing above the ceiling, okay? So if, if, if the world ended at the ceiling, that would be depressing. Um, and that's basically Solomon's point. Uh, and so if you were sitting there praying your heart out and your prayers boonk, hit the ceiling and bounce back off, what's the point then? What, why not live it up? Because again, if, if everything ends with the ceiling, why bother? Why bother living for higher ideals? Why bother living to pass things on? It doesn't matter. You're dead. And so he'll talk about the cycle of life and how everything wears out and gets reborn and you know, the mountains will erode down and the, the waters will, will wash from the mountainside into the sea and then go back again. And he's like, it's just, it's just an endless cycle. Why bother? I could build this giant statue to myself and people could remember my name, but I, what's it matter? The statue's eventually going to come down. Nobody cares. They're going to forget who I was. Why do I bother living the way that I do if everything ends just pink at the ceiling? Now, his point is not that everything ends at the ceiling. His point is, no, 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 there's actually stuff beyond the ceiling. That's why we live the way we do. But if we play the mental like word game that everything ends at the ceiling, think about your life and how much wouldn't make any sense at all. And that's his point with under the sun. It's this idea of if there's nothing above the sun, if there's no afterlife, if there's no God, if basically my destiny is to die and turn into worm food, why am I bothering to live the way that I do? I might as well just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow I'm going to die and it doesn't matter. Now, coincidentally, that point I just brought up, you actually should enjoy your life. And there, that is a big point that will come up in the book of Ecclesiastes. It's not wrong to enjoy your life. But that's not all you do. Because again, there is something above the sun. So, so that's, that's part of this. Um, you can see a lot of these things uh, jotted down here. Um, now, one of the points I don't have in, on the overhead, but look at, uh, again, page two of your notes. It says this, Solomon attempts to provide an answer for why certain actions, such as those described in other wisdom literature, do not provide the same result as it is apparently promised. In doing so, he shows that time and chance happen to all men, independent of their actions and attitudes. And so, um, this is a big part. I might actually even show the video. What Solomon is doing throughout the book of Ecclesiastes is he's trying to show us that God can't be put into a box. So, if, if I can make a comparison. Look at the book of Proverbs and look at the book of Ecclesiastes. If you compare those two books, you're going to find that the book of Proverbs kind of presents God almost like a vending machine. All right? So, so I want you to imagine, you walk up, you put your coins in the vending machine, you push button A, you get object A. Just, just happens. Like, it, it's guaranteed. Unless there's something broken with the machine, which never happens. Uh, uh, <laughs> unless there's something broken, you always get what you push. Proverbs presents life like that. You do this, you always get this result. You do this, you always get this result. You do this, you always get this result. You could almost then approach God almost like he's a robot where it's, hey God, I did this, so you deserve to give me this. All right? Now, that's obviously not how we're supposed to react, but we're, we're pattern stalwart. Like, we humans love to see patterns. We love to figure things out. And so we have a natural bent toward push button A, get result A. Not too hard. Don't push button A, get bad result A. You know, like, that's, that's how our brains are kind of wired to work. What Solomon's doing is he's coming along and he's saying, hold on, hold on, I'm just, I'm going to bring some nuance to this conversation because life's not really like that. And so I, I think a good rule of thumb, and we'll, we'll unpack this as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes. What Solomon is doing is he's saying, I'm writing down proverbs and little bits of wisdom because that's generally how the world works. All right? Generally, if you live this way, you will get this result. Generally, if you live this way, you will get this result. That's generally how the world works. So don't get all frustrated when you go up and you push button A and it's broken. Because God might be doing something behind the scenes and he might be teaching you something else. So don't get frustrated with God and give up because 
I'm pushing button A and I'm just not getting the result I thought I'd get. And so he'll talk about the race is not to the strong. He'll be like, time and chance happeneth to them all. You know, you could be the strongest man who ever lived and you could walk outside and a tree falls on you and you're dead. Nuts. You know, that's just, that's just life and, and death. Um, but, but that's just how the world works. There are times where things happen, time and chance just happens. All right? And so what he's doing is he's trying to say Proverbs and these wisdom literature things, they are generally true. They're trying to teach us general truths about the world, but understand that there are times where God steps in and says, I'm going to be working behind the scenes. So I'll give you one more definition that I like to use, and it's this idea of chance or luck. Um, if you study out that concept in the Bible, you basically get the idea that chance or luck is when God is working, but he can't be seen. All right, I'll give you a whole book that deals with this. Uh, have you ever studied out the book of Esther? All right, what's amazing about the book of Esther, and we don't have time to dig into it, the book of Esther is an entire story about all these weird coincidences that happen, and you can see God's fingerprints all over the book. Like, the book screams God working behind the scenes. But what's really funny is you never actually see God's name mentioned once in the whole book. And so, I mean, it's, it's completely random chance happening behind the scenes where God's just working. And it's this dude who's like hanging out near a wall and these guys are conspiring against the king and he just happens to be in the right place at the right time. And that happens to be written down in a book. And then later on in the book, the king just happens to not be able to sleep. And so he's like, read for me the most boring thing you can find, which happens to be the history book of the kingdom. And so he's sitting there listening and he's like, oh yeah, I remember that. Did that guy ever get rewarded? Huh. Well, we should do something about that. And it just happens to be the people who are going to be put to death. And it happens to be, you'll, you'll see that word happenstance or happeneth and happens by. It's chance. It just happened. And it's God basically saying, I'm pulling the strings behind the scenes. It's just, you can't see it. And so what you're going to see through the book of Ecclesiastes is Solomon is talking about all the stuff that God's doing behind the scenes. Now, to understand where Solomon comes from, what I want to do is I want to spend just a little bit of time this morning, and this is probably going to be all the time we have, um, I want to unpack Solomon's family history. All right? I want you to kind of see what kingdom Solomon fell into. I want you to see kind of where Solomon came from, and then we're going to kind of, so we're going to pivot away from Ecclesiastes for a second, and then we'll pivot back next week, and you'll kind of see how this all ties together. So as we go through it, it all starts with David, all right? And uh, I believe this is Gustav Dore, which is... Just a great artist. Um, but anyway, you got this, this old story of David, all right? And uh, you guys know a lot about David, all right? He's, he's a, probably a teenage kid. Uh, he has a penchant for throwing rocks like every good teenage kid, only he managed to channel that creative energy into uh, target practice, uh, big target practice, all right? And uh, so we know that story. Um, now understand that as the story is told, it may not necessarily be told in chronological order. It may be more of a thematic order. And so there's times where it's like, David, I feel like you already met Saul. How come you're being introduced to him? And it, it might be that the story is told out of chronological order, but we'll, we'll skip into that. All right, uh, again, First and Second Samuel, uh, that whole chunk of the Bible is covering the early kingdom of Israel and up through the end of David's life. All right, and uh, so we're going to read the whole... No, I'm just kidding. Um, it, it is a depressing read. Uh, I don't know if you've ever sat down and just read it all in like just a few sittings. There are times as you read through First and Second Samuel and First and Second Chronicles, where you just kind of feel dirty. Like there's just so much wickedness and filth in the kings that, that were around. Um, David is kind of set up as like the pinnacle. Like he is the king you want to be like. He is the king that's kind of the golden standard. Um, God would describe David as a man after his own heart. Uh, not that he was flawless, but the, the way he loved God and the way he sought after God, even though he failed a lot. Um, just kind of sets up the standard. And so that's something. Uh, First Kings, the very beginning of it, is going to cover the, cover the death of David all the way up into the line of Solomon and then cover a few future kings. And so if you're kind of getting the backstory for Solomon, these are the three books specifically you want to read. All right? And so they're telling the backstory. And uh, again, First and Second Chronicles are going to repeat a few of the stories. And so there are times where we'll say, well, First Kings says this, but Second Chronicles says that. And what it is, is it's like kind of two parts to the same story to kind of build out the whole. Um, and so there are times where, um, this is a complete side note, but there are times where if you read the numbers, like, you know, he had so many thousand chariots, you'll read that in First and Second Kings, 
there'll be actually a different number in Chronicles. Pay attention to the really, really careful details because sometimes it's like, oh, that was talking about the chariot riders and that was talking about the chariots. And so there's a lot of people who will absolutely scour these books and that's where most of the contradictions in the Bible come because they don't understand what the numbers are trying to tell you. Uh, there are times where it's like, well, it said he was 20 years old. No, that one says he was 40. Okay, one's talking about his age. The other's talking about how old his dynasty is. So, so that's just a little, tuck that in your back pocket. Um, if you want a whole book that just way too much study goes into it, uh, there's a book uh, called Those So-Called Errors, and it just unpacks like all of that and shows you how all that works. So um, anyway, that's, that's beside the point. But uh, this is where we're going to get a lot of our background information. Now, as we study the life of David, um, he rises to notoriety after the killing of Goliath. All right, hopefully that's not a surprise to you, um, but that's basically what it is. I thought it was really, really funny because right after David kills Goliath, you start seeing people chanting like, he's a man of war and Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And it's like, he's slain one guy. He's slain one guy. So, so the, the, the options are either it's not written in chronological order. And so maybe that actually came after David had gotten involved or they were just so excited and you know how mobs get, um, they just, <laughs> they just start well, oh, he's awesome. If he kills Goliath, it counts as more than one, right? Um, and that's, so who knows? Uh, but it, I, I did always find that funny, how, how David is like just boosted to notoriety um, after killing one dude. Uh, and it's just, it's just hilarious. Now, obviously you get all the um, other uh, court drama that goes along with it. Uh, he becomes the court musician for Saul. Uh, and eventually uh, Saul will become jealous of David. He'll hunt him across the countryside. And there's just, I mean, that's just a really fascinating story in itself, but uh, outside of what we're trying to get to. And so uh, David is going to kind of rise through the ranks. He's going to be very uh, well-known, very well-loved in the nation of Israel. And eventually, after the death of Saul and his kids, uh, David will come to reign in the area of Hebron uh, for a few years. And then eventually he'll take over the whole kingdom. And so that's, that's kind of David's rise to power. Um, it, again, fascinating story in its own right. But... David also has a lot of other issues uh, that you need to understand. He becomes the ideal king. Now, the big part of what makes David the ideal king that I want you guys to grasp is the fact that he chooses not to go after idolatry at all. All right? Um, back then, you would make alliances with other kingdoms by marrying into their family. Um, a lot of times that would drag you into worshiping their gods. There would be a lot of issues that would come along with that. Uh, Solomon is going to get to the point where by making marriage alliances. I, I keep getting the numbers backwards, so I, I can't remember. He either has 700 wives and 300 concubines or vice versa, but the fact is he has about a thousand wives. You know he wasn't marrying for love, um, saying nobody got that much love, and uh, Solomon is basically just marrying for alliances because, hey, I'm your son-in-law. You wouldn't attack me, right? And, uh, and that's, that's what Solomon will do, but in doing that, Solomon will be dragged after all of their other gods because, you know, you can't you can't marry the princess of Pharaoh and not expect to worship, you know, or at least set up a little shrine for her God. And then you've got this guy over here who, yeah, you're going to set up your God too, and set up your God. And, oh, I guess I have to go to your church today. And, and that's basically whether he believed it or not, Solomon is going to get into idolatry throughout his life, but David didn't. And so David is constantly going to be the one compared to because he is the ideal king. All right, Kings with a hard attitude after God are always going to be said to be after King David, and those who won't are going to be contrasted with him. So again, none of this stuff is new, but I want you to kind of grasp the type of spiritual state Solomon follows. All right, So this is David. Um, I, I forget who we were talking with. I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and they were talking about David and like how much he failed as a dad. Um, I mean, there's just so much stuff that goes on in his household that you're like, how could you let that happen? Like, well, I mean, he's king. He's ruling over all sorts of things. There's, there's going to be things that he's not paying attention to. He has multiple wives and multiple kids from multiple wives. You think he's really paying attention? So even though David loved God and even though he really cared, there were some really important things like raising his kids that David completely didn't do. Um, we'll, we'll get into it in just a sec. Um, now... Uh, David isn't perfect, okay? And this specific area of his life is really important because this is where Solomon comes from. Um, there's one of David's mighty men. He's a counselor named Ahithophel. He has a granddaughter named Bathsheba. Now, you can get this information by piecing together a few different parts of the Bible, and you get the idea that Ahithophel is David's 
basically grandfather-in-law. So, well, eventually, but he was dead by then, so I guess it didn't matter. Um, David is uh, looking out over his balcony, and uh, I've heard a lot of people arguing back and forth on um, whether Bathsheba was intentionally trying to seduce David or not. And the one book I read put it in a really good light, and they said this. If you work in the White House, you know exactly how far away your office is from the Oval Office. The Oval Office is the like central location, and it's actually like almost like a ranking system, like how good your office is based on how close you are to the president's office. You know exactly where the president is. You know exactly what's going on. If your king or your president is choosing to stay in the city that day, you know where the king is. So I want you to think about it in that perspective. Bathsheba knows full well David's at home. She knows full well that her house is so far away from the capital, like right there, away from the king's palace. So I've heard someone say, I think she knew what she was doing, because she chose when everybody would have known the king was there. She knew exactly where her house was in relation to the palace, and she chose to be on top of the roof bathing, which may not have been normal, I don't know. Um, now, you can argue on that. It, it doesn't really matter. The fact is, David steps out on his balcony, he sees Bathsheba bathing, and what's fascinating is a lot of people in the city probably knew what David had done. Here's why. David goes to his servant and says, who is that? And they go, oh, isn't that uh, you know, the wife of Uriah? And he's like, all right, go get her for me. So at least a few servants know exactly what's going on. And then, so they go get her and he commits adultery, as you guys know. And then she sends a message to him and... I, I doubt the courier is quite so subtle to not peek a little bit. Um, maybe he was that brave. Um, but there's probably a pretty good gossip mill going on, knowing something's up. All right. I mean, you think about how gossip spreads. And then David calls Uriah back, and you have to imagine Uriah knew something was up, because you don't just call random soldiers back to say, hey, how's the war going? And Uriah refuses to play the game. As you guys know, David tries and tries and tries. And Uriah refuses to give in and play the game. And so David says, all right, well, Uriah, you're going to head back and give my condolences to everyone there at the battlefield. And basically, he sends him back with his death warrant. And he sends him back, and the, the, the commanding officer sets him into a specific spot where the battle is hottest, and Uriah is dead. And so you're kind of like, ah, oh, David. Ah, oh, David. And, and if I can get a bit devotional on us, the one thing I find extremely potent about this story is this simple fact. If you look earlier in David's life, there was a moment in his life where his conscience was so sensitive that he couldn't cut the hem off of Saul's garment without feeling convicted about it. So literally, he, he cuts the hem off of Saul's robe to prove, I had you dead to rights. Like, I could have killed you when you were in this cave, and I chose not to. And David views that action as I raised my hand against God's anointed. And he's so convicted about it, he actually puts himself in danger to step out and say, I was wrong, Saul. Like, I don't know that he said that to him, but he, he exposed himself, and, and he was wrong doing that. But then later on in his life, David will... Now, he, he had the authority to skip out on war, but that wasn't a wise choice. He will take someone else's wife, commit adultery live in it for a while, and then when it's found out that she's pregnant, he will call for the, the husband to come back. He will try everything in his power to get the husband to do the wrong thing, uh, at least the dishonorable thing. And then he will eventually send that husband back, intentionally putting him in the spot where he'll die, and he thinks that he's covered it up. And it's not until a prophet appears and says, uh, David, let's have a talk, that he actually feels conviction about it. It, it's just crazy that he could be in such a sensitive spiritual state and a not-so-sensitive spiritual state. What happened? You know, and that's, that's just a powerful thought I've mulled over throughout my life, is there are times where we are super sensitive to something, and then later on we just indulge in it willy-nilly, and it, it doesn't bother us. And so the Bible warns us to be careful because, you know, your conscience might be seared as with a hot iron. you just you got to be careful about how much you let sin taint you. Um, and, and so David himself, a man after God's own heart, is, is going to do some of those things. Um, again, uh, so Uriah dies. Uh, David will take Bathsheba to be his wife, and Solomon 
will be the child born after, like one of the next children. All right. Um, now, Nathan, there, there is a Nathan who is a descendant of David, and there's a Nathan the prophet. And so just pay attention to the difference. Uh, Nathan the prophet will show up. I, I think this gives you some really, really cool context, because back then, their culture was a lot about shame. And so it might not have been like so much about sin and guilt. It might have been about shame. Like you did something extremely dishonorable. And so what Nathan is doing is he's using uh, kind of the culture against David where you did something that was very dishonorable. You did something that was sinful. And he's using that to kind of bring David back to a state of repentance. And so what he does is he comes in, um, he, he tells a story. And the power of narrative and the power of stirring David's emotion, he sets a trap for David. And you guys, you guys know how this works. Uh, he comes in and he says, hey, David, let me tell you a story. And he says, there, there's, a, there's a woman, um, well, there's a man who, who he had all the sheep that he could ever want. I mean, he had just this whole herd of sheep, and he, he had a guest come, and he really wanted to take care of the guest. And uh, you know what? He just, he looked at all the sheep that he had, and he said, you know what? I don't, I don't want to use any of these sheep. And he looked over, and he saw his neighbor, and his neighbor had just this one just precious little lamb that he just absolutely loved. It was like a child to him. And he just loved on this little lamb. And I mean, it was his precious. And along came this grumpy neighbor who had all the sheep in it that he could ever want. And he looked and he said, I don't want to take one of my own. I'm going to take that guy's. And so he took that lamb, ripped it out of him, killed it, served it as food to the, the guest. And he's like, yeah, so, so what should we do with this guy? And I mean, David has some righteous indignation. He has some like really, you know, like, how dare he? That's so unjust. And we're going to lay out this punishment and this punishment and this punishment. And Nathan goes, you are the man. And, and I just want you to think like David was in such a spiritual state that he could mete out justice on a guy who stole someone else's animal. But he wasn't interested in meting out justice for the guy who had just stolen someone's wife and put him to death because he didn't see it. It was, it was a blind spot. It was something that he didn't, he didn't comprehend because it hadn't been shined in his face. He overlooked it. Uh, I've, been, I've been reading about um, how people make decisions and certain other things. And uh, there's this, this certain, th there, there are two things people will often mess up. There's something called cognitive dissonance. It's a psychological term. Um, but basically what it is, is it's, I'm doing something in my life that contradicts the core of who I am and I'm making excuses for it because, I mean, I, I tell the truth. And so when I tell a lie, I then have to remedy the fact that I'm telling a truth, but I, I lied. And so you come up with this weird way of explaining it in your head. And typically what happens to people when this is happening to them, their eyes get really big. And you can see them trying to convince themselves of what they're saying. And it's just really fun to watch. Um, and, and so you'll see it on the news a lot where people are like trying to say something and they're trying to convince you of it. And their eyes are really big and they're really trying to be convincing. And you're like, you're trying to convince yourself. And the, the, the guy who I was reading said, most people will see this in others, but they refuse to see it in themselves. They don't think that they're capable of cognitive dis dissonance. The other one he said is, co uh, is confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. And it's like this idea that you think that all facts back up your idea. You think that everything, all the facts that you see back up your worldview. And so you're justifying everything in light of your worldview. And he says, people think that only other people do that. And it's not until it's like really, really in your face that you suddenly realize, oh, I'm doing it too. I, I think that's important because what David was doing is he basically was living in a state of cognitive dissonance. Like he was thinking he was okay. He was thinking he was godly. He was thinking that he could still make good moral judgments. But then Nathan comes and is like, so there's a guy who stole another guy's sheep. Kill him! And you're like, I don't, I don't think you're, you're just as you think you are right now, David. Uh, and so, so that's what happens. Now, the amazing thing is, and this is what separates David from Saul. Saul is going to make excuses when he's caught in sin. He's going to come up with every explanation under the sun. Oh, the, the people made me do it. Uh, I, uh, basically, I was, uh, he just comes up with all the reasons you could ever imagine. Well, David basically just says, you know what? I've sinned, and I've, against God and God only have I sinned. Which, which again, is... is more or less what he's doing is he's skipping everyone else and saying, I offended God. And if I can get right with God, then I can get right with anyone else. Like, God is the one I've, I've violated his laws. He is the one I've sinned against. And so David repents. He's forgiven. However, because what David did is going to give a lot of grounds for blasphemy, 
there are still going to be some punishments that come. And so that's, that's an important concept in its own right. We can repent, but that doesn't take away the punishment of the sin. Because if you imagine it, it's like this. The moment I do the sin, the judgment's on its way. So I, I've sinned. Judgment is kind of like put into that little pneumatic tube, you know, like the bank tube. And it's like, boom. And, and it's on its way. It, it might take a while to get there. But then in the process, if I repent, God has the option to say, oh, well, I can stop that. Boom. Or he can say, ah, it's still coming. So that's why there are times where like, you've repented of something sincerely, virtuously, but the punishment still hits you because it, it's, it's on its way. Like there's, God makes those choices. All right? And so, so David repents, but again, because there's blasphemy that could be done, there's still going to be some punishments on his house for this. This is important because Solomon should have paid attention to this because Solomon knew the punishment for idolatry. If you doubt the punishment for idolatry, just read the book of Judges sometimes. It happens about seven times throughout the book. Uh, I remember teaching a class for little kids on judges, and I would go through the cycle on, like, hey, this is the cycle. This is what would happen. And I was going through the cycle of, of how they would come into slavery, and they'd repent, and God would protect them. And then they'd go back into idolatry and go back into slavery, and God would, they would repent, and God would protect. And, I mean, it got to the point where the kid was like, we get it. And it's like, ah, but that's the point. Israel didn't. And it's just this constant cycle of, like, you know what happens when you fall into idolatry. You know what Solomon does? He ignores everything he should have known and for political expedience says, eh, I'm going to play around with idolatry a little bit. And the judgment comes for that. And, and so, so again, we're, we're pulling lessons out of David that Solomon should have learned. Um, now, continuing on this, um, in essence, what happens is David is going to reap what he sowed. Um, others are going to sleep with his wives. So that's one of the main punishments that he receives. Um, and this is fulfilled when Absalom takes over. Uh, the sword will never depart from his house. So because he slew Uriah with the sword, he's going to have the sword come back on his house. This is going to be basically the whole Absalom cycle is going to happen again. And then the child is not going to survive birth. Um, and again, that's, that's an important fact is God controls life. And so God can basically say, I'm going to choose not to preserve this life, which, which is what we call killing it. But but really what it is, is God saying, I hold life in my hand. So I can choose at any moment I want to, to say, okay, it's loosed and, and you die. And so what he's going to do is he's going to say, David, I'm not going to let this child survive. That's, that's what's going to happen. And so these are the punishments laid out. Um, and this is a pretty steep punishment. All right. This is pretty harsh, but it's fitting for what David did, but it's still a lot to bear. All right, and so you can imagine why David would, would probably struggle throughout the rest of his life. Because again, if you're, if you're bearing these consequences, it's, that's just, it's a lot to bear. Now, I'm going to give you little titles, and you can kind of see the next phases of David's life and how it leads into Solomon. The first major title is obviously Tamar and Amnon. It's just a nasty situation. I think the thing we have to pull out of it is David did nothing about it. He got mad. But that doesn't help. Okay? So you're getting a picture of, of how involved David was or how, I mean, David was the king. He had the right to step in and say, hold on, that, that is the death penalty right there. Thinking through this, I, I do believe, and I've had to face this myself with certain discipline situations I've had to handle. If, if I can project onto David the way I would think, I believe what happened with David is he had done some of these same things. And so he probably felt a little hypocritical punishing for things that he himself had done. I'm not sure. But I know there have been times where I've had to deal with discipline situations for things that I myself have struggled with or did struggle with at that time. And I had to go, I still have to push through and I still have to be consistent. And, and it's been the story of David that's inspired me to do it. Because what David did is you know the story, he basically just got mad at Amnon for what he did. Well, that doesn't help. That's, there's, there's no discipline there. There's no punishment. There's no judgment from the king for this horrendous crime. But Absalom took care of it. And that's, that's kind of the, the thing we need to realize is there are, there are discipline situations that if we choose not to deal with them, someone else will eventually and it'll probably be a lot harder on that person because of it. Um, 
not, not to get political, but if you look at a lot of the people who are dying around the country right now at the hands of cops, I want you to stop and think about all the crimes that they have committed leading up to the point where they got shot. Again, I'm not saying, oh, they should have gotten shot. I, I'm just saying, if you look at all the drug deals and look at all the thefts and all the rapes and all the violence, nobody stopped it. Nobody disciplined that. Or if they did, they didn't do an effective job. And so eventually it comes to society to take care of it, and society is not kind. In fact, it normally leads to you dying or, 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 or crippled or something. So that's where this idea of you may have to handle a disciplined situation that puts you in an awkward state. It's still better that someone that loves them deals with it than society deals with it because society is not kind and society will deal the ultimate penalty. So that's something that we just need to remember because Amnon does this and Absalom takes care of the problem. Now Absalom will take care of it. This is where it's weird because now David steps in and he exiles Absalom. Again, that's not the punishment for murder, okay? But he chooses that punishment. Um, so Absalom goes into exile, and eventually, through various you know, machinations of the court, uh, Absalom comes back, but very quickly leads a revolt and takes over the kingdom. Now remember what the prophecy, the, the punishment said, the sword will not leave your house. So now we've already seen the sword enter into his house a time or two, and now Absalom's taking over the kingdom, and Ahithophel, that counselor, as we saw a few weeks ago, Ahithophel is now working against David, and you can see that it, it's driven by vengeance. It's the, you did this to my daughter and my, you know, my granddaughter and my grandson-in-law. I hate you now, and I he's will come at dead. you. Well, he's not dead yet, but oh. he, he will be. Um, and so you, you see some of these things happening. Um, and then just... The disturbing part of the story, but again, it's part of the punishment. Absalom violates David's concubines on the roof in front of Israel. So it's just... Now, why do I tell you all this? This is the world Solomon was born into. Like, Solomon got to see and hear a lot of these stories. Like, if he wasn't born at the moment that these happened, he was at least knowledgeable about all this chaos. This is crazy. This is the life that is going on around Solomon. And so just imagine being born into this chaos. And so you can kind of see Solomon going, okay, so that's what happens when you do that. And, Oof, that's what happens when you do that. And that's what happens when you neglect that. And so he'll start talking about things like through slothfulness, the building collapses, you know, and some of these things where he's like, I understand if you don't take care of it, it it's going to eventually collapse. And it's true with buildings. It's true with kingdoms. It's true with families. Ugh. And, and so you can see where some of Solomon's like life experiences, as he starts putting Proverbs together, there's a depth of meaning there that just goes far beyond just exactly what he said. All right, uh, moving quickly, I just want to wrap this up in the next few minutes. Um, the, the revolt is put down. Um, Absalom gets his hair caught up in the tree, and he's, he's executed. And so now David has lost another son. And so, again, he, he refused to deal with the, the Amnon thing, so Amnon gets killed by Absalom. He refuses to deal properly with Absalom. So his whole kingdom is thrown into revolt and his general takes care of Absalom. So like I said, if David had taken care of these things instead of saying, I, I just can't, like I can't, they're my kids. No, if, if he had taken care of it, he could have cut this off at the pass. But for whatever reason, David didn't, didn't do these. Um, following up, this, this is basically a, a, life, a lifeline of David to kind of show how Solomon became king. David's first son, Amnon, is dead by the hands of Absalom. His second son, Kiliab, we don't know what happened to him. He apparently died young since the Bible pretty much stops mentioning anything about him. His third son, Absalom, is executed by hang while hanging from his hair from a tree. Um, so, uh, uh, next in line seems to be Abnijah. And again, there seems to be other sons, but either they died young or they were skipped over for various reasons. And so... David had a lot of sons, but you're noticing they're getting picked off one by one. Because Solomon was not David's next in line. Like, he was pretty far down the list. Um, and so that's, that's where we are in this, this account. Now again, Nathan is also a son of David through Bathsheba. He becomes an ancestor of Jesus, according to Luke. Um, most likely through the line of Mary. And Solomon becomes the next king 
uh, and is also an ancestor of Jesus through Joseph, uh, according to Matthew. So there, there's the, the two lines that come down, and there's some complicated stuff there we won't get into. Um, but both Solomon and Nathan. So David actually kind of double connects down. Um, so that, that's a really neat story, but I just I don't have time to get into it. I wish I did. And so this is how Solomon is going to become king. So uh, a lot of backstabbing, betrayal, chaos, carnage, and uh, that is the life of Solomon. Um, I will summarize the last bit of it here, and then we'll be done. Uh, eventually, David will appoint Solomon to be the next king. And if you can imagine in your 20s being given rulership over a whole kingdom, you're probably not going to have the knowledge to know what to do. And uh, so what Solomon does is Solomon, uh, according to the Bible, he just starts offering sacrifices and sacrifices and sacrifices and sacrifices. And he's worshiping God like crazy. And God appears to him in a dream and says, all right, Solomon, what do you want? And Solomon says, I am the ruler of this kingdom and I am a child and I do not know what to do. So I want wisdom. So God says, mm, good, good, good ask. He says, you could have asked for the lives of your enemies. You could have asked for wealth. You could have asked for all this other stuff. But since you asked for wisdom, I'm going to give it to you. And I'm going to give you all the other stuff besides. And so Solomon is going to get to the point during his reign that it said that a, a block of, like a little chunk of silver was like a stone in the street. And so if you can imagine being so rich that it would not be worth your time to bend over and pick up a block of silver. That's Solomon. And so as you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, he's going to talk about all the things he bought and all the things he had and all the things he went out and got and the shipments that would come in. And he was filthy rich. And that's why it's important to note because he says that didn't satisfy. And, and so there's a lot of that stuff that Solomon's going to draw in personal experience. And uh, that's, that's where Solomon's going to be. All right. Uh, as we close out, any questions or comments? I know I, I dealt with a lot of stuff this morning. I probably covered a few things you hadn't heard quite specifically yet. Um, but any, any questions or comments? Yeah.